I've been a professional web developer for 24 years almost. Uh, and when I started, uh, it was all fields. It was really all fields. All interactivity we had on the web was HTML elements that you type something in, you send it off to the server to go to your PHP, not PHP even, Perl, ASP for the really terrible people, and Java and whatever on the back end and render more HTML out. That's why HTML was never seen as something sensible. It was seen as something that a better language should render out. And these web developers are people that we don't really care about. And then we added labels to fields. We didn't add labels for accessibility, which we should because nobody cared back then. But actually what we did, we had JavaScript out of a sudden. And JavaScript allowed us to create interactivity in the browser and become real developers on the front end side. The problem with JavaScript, though, was that uh, uh, we, we, we all of a sudden didn't want to be web developers anymore. We wanted to show that we're better than that. We're something new. JavaScript gives us the power that we always wanted. So we created lots of labels around our JavaScript work. First, we just said JavaScript. Then it was DHTML, dynamic HTML. And then we said it's, ba it's bad doing DHTML because it's only for one browser and not for the other. And it's relying on JavaScript. So we called it unobtrusive JavaScript. Then Flash came around. Then we called it DOM scripting. Then Ajax was the next cool thing. And Comet was a thing that flashed past and didn't leave a mark, but it was there. And the fun thing was that the, uh, the way we learned these things was a very simple way of thinking about it, a logical order. We learned the things first. We looked up what's in JavaScript, what the possibilities in JavaScript are, and then we actually started developing with it. We created something in the browser, and we actually found out what's going on there. But there was a lot of testing and trying things out. Was it professional what we did? Absolutely not, but it was creative, it was wonderful, it was a brave new world of something new that we haven't done before. And the weird thing is we couldn't even test or we couldn't even know what we're doing because there were no debugging tools. The debugging tool was an alert. And then you sometimes had a loop where you get stuck in the alert and you had to shut down your browser or your computer even back then. And then out of a sudden, we said, we need debugging tools. And Firebug came around. And then developer tools in the browser came around. And out of a sudden, we could do everything in the browser. We could learn something, we could develop, and we can debug in the browser. It was great. And then we added abstractions, because differences in browsers made us not as effective as we thought we should be. So we came up with libraries, Ajax libraries, jQuery, all these things that people used and still, still use, sadly enough, a lot of them are out there and made, made our life easier. And then we realized we create far too much code that way and we rely on far too many things. So we created build processes. In essence, we wrote more code to undo the, the code that we've written too much for our end users because our end users should not suffer our creativity. So nowadays, it's a totally different world. We always say we're developers, we're developing things, but what we mostly do is depend on other things. We're using other people's code to build our code, to create things that are bigger and better than ours, standing on the shoulders of giants, as some people say. And that sometimes is a problem, because the debugging doesn't work as easily as it used to, because we're not creating the JavaScript that we're debugging. Sometimes we have to know where it comes from, from the abstraction, from the third-party thing, from that 10,516 node module that we just included because it's safe and why not. And the learning thing is mostly about the platform, the abstraction of the platform, not the platform itself. I can't keep up with what's in CSS and what's in JavaScript anymore because I'm too, uh, I'm too tempted to use this React, that view, these kind of things. And the platform has moved on. We've got great things. We've got wonderful things in the platform itself and it should be enough to build something good. But we always want to be better. So we're kind of caught in the rush of the new thing, the new and shiny, the better thing. The web is broken, we need to do a virtual DOM. We need to do a virtual this, we need to do that better and that better. Why are browsers so slow? Because you don't use the platform, and we cannot actually make the platform better if it's not being used. And in essence, we're focusing on the wrong thing. We should be focusing on our end users. The end users out there are there for us to actually have a living. They pay our companies for the things that we create. Our job is to build things to allow people to do things. 
That's it. We're a delivery service. It's not about us. It's about the end users that we're there. And these are people with horrible browsers, terrible environments, really bad connectivity, with physical disabilities, with problems in their eyesight, with all kinds of things that we have to deal with. And it is not about us. It's about our tech legacy. I work a lot with enterprise and legacy companies right now, and I see a lot of old code that is unloved, untouched, not being used by anybody, but by millions of users. And nobody maintains that anymore because we're too busy chasing the next thing. So the tech legacy that we leave behind, the products that actually lock people out because of their ability, because of their language, because of their location on the planet, is actually giving us a bad reputation. Tech has, does not have a good reputation nowadays. Back days when I started, we were the geeks nobody cared about. Then we were the cool innovators of that cool new thing called web. And now we're like, ah, oh, that's like the bankers of the 80s. That's a horrible elitist group of people that actually are hard to get into. The weird thing is that developers are people too, most of them actually. And I like people, most of my friends are people. <laughs> Dogs are better, but developers are people too. So we, we don't actually see as much patience for other developers as we see for our end users. We have thousands of performance talks how to make your products fast. We don't have many talks how easy it is to become a developer and to, main, uh, and to join an open source project and actually start playing in this world. There's not enough information about that out there. And of course we have an overload as developers. We are demanded, people ask us to actually know about performance, know about security, accessibility, and so on and so forth. Nobody can know all of this. We're pretending we do, or we specialize in one of them, and then blame others that they're not good at it. But nobody can do that. We're just feeling overwhelmed. By the time I look at something in Hacker News, and I'm like, yeah, i got to take a look at that, and then by the time I have time to look at it, somebody said, don't use it any longer. <laughs> and I feel like I'm out of touch. I don't know what's going on anymore. I probably should be a goat farmer or something like that. <laughs> and we don't actually work with these things. We don't care about performance, security, accessibility, and these kind of things too much. We actually work on faith. We hope that the framework that we're using has all of that built in. Performance, of course, when, it's, when, when the, the framework scales for Facebook, it probably is good for that website I did for that florist as well. Accessibility, like they, they probably have thought of that as well. We're actually not doing it. We're hoping that the magic of the framework and the abstractions takes away all that, that, those thinking from us. And I think we're missing a lot of opportunity, a lot of growth that we had at the beginning of the market, where people came in sideways from nowhere, from like that they, weren't, they, they didn't go to university, they didn't learn about computers, they just wanted to build things for the web. At PariWeb, at the first one, one of the best talks I've given, I had a chat I had with somebody about JavaScript, was a physical architect asking me how to architect code. And I was just, this is bizarre. But he had wonderful ideas, sideways ideas that I put in a framework back then. But we, we gave up on that to a degree. We say, like, you gotta, you gotta use that or you're not a full developer, not a 100% developer. A quick story about this. The other day, somebody uh, emailed me, um, well, pinged me on Twitter and said, like, oh, I want to I wanna have this project. Can you take a look at the website if it's actually good? One HTML document, a simple HTML document with a few SVG images in it. And he's like, yeah, see if the content of the message works. And I found a, a typo in there. And I'm like, OK, I'm a good citizen of the web. I go to GitHub, I fork this thing, I download it, and I build it on my own machine and fix that typo for that person to be a nice person. 150 megabyte of node dependencies were downloaded for a single HTML document. And then it didn't work because I used it on my Ubuntu box. Then I did it on my Mac again and it worked, but I ended up, I'm not caring anymore, I went to GitHub, pressed the edit button, edited it directly there, sent the press request there. And I'm on a fast computer, I'm on a good connectivity. Imagine me being a Bangladeshi developer who wants to join an open source project and the first thing that person encounters is 150 megabyte of random code that doesn't mean anything for fixing a typo. We should be better than that. We have amazing technology and yet nobody's happy. 
A lot of people are overloaded with like, I don't want to join this group of people that just have 150 megabyte of random stuff. And we basically, oh, if people don't know about Node and, uh, and NPM, they don't know CSS. What? <laughs> but you get these, like people like, oh, you got to be professional, you got to know that and that. We have stopped playing with the platform itself. We stopped creating CSS hacks to work around issues with the browser. We stopped thinking about JavaScript solutions that are JavaScript rather than just another module, another abstraction. I keep calling us nowadays to full stack overflow developers. <laughs> because you just, when you don't know something, you go to stack overflow, you copy and paste that obviously secure and perfect code, and you put it inside your thing. And then it works. So what went wrong? Where is, where is the problem? Where is the, where is the, the happiness gone? Where is the uh, finding something out gone, the power that we had back then? I think we have too much choice. And that's a good thing, but it's also an overwhelming thing. And I'm working on developer tools right now, and when I see this, I'm excited what we have in there. I also have no idea what 80% of these things are. When you look at the statistics in developer tools, what people are using, it's like 10% of all the offers in there. There's things five menus deep that are really, really amazing, and our click-through rate shows nobody ever looked at that thing. But somebody on a conference said, we built this in there, everybody clapped, everybody got excited, and said, like, finally we have this tool. We have great debugging in these things. Breakpoints. What do people use? Console log. Another problem that I think is that context switching is mentally exhausting. I go from my editor to my browser, I go to the, to the website to read up some documentation when I don't know when, when something's going, or to Stack Overflow to copy and paste it. Then I go to the command line to actually do all my git commands, and I jump in between these contexts all the time. It feels like cool, you know, like we, we, I know the matrix and I know that. But at the same time, we're mentally exhausted by jumping between all these things. We're also spending far too much time customizing all of those. How many blog posts have you probably seen the last few months? What is the best dark theme for your text editor? And you're not a professional developer if you don't use that font with those ligatures in your, in your developer environment. You're like, what the hell is going on? So I think it's time to rethink tooling. I think our tools, the things that we develop with, should prevent us from doing things wrong instead of patching up what we created. That thing that in the, in the beginning that I showed that like we learn, we create, and then we actually debug. Why is this actually so disconnected from each other? I'd rather see a world where we have the learning as part of the debugging and the developing. Because we've been doing this for 20 years. We know a lot of things that are wrong. We know a lot of things how to fix them. We put them on our blogs. We put them in like great articles and books and hope people find them. Why don't we put them where people are using things right now? So an idea of holistic developer tools, a lightweight, pre-configured, and open to feedback and contribution developer tool. Online things like CodePen, JSBin, uh, StackBlitz, um, Code Sandbox. These are great. These are wonderful. I want to try out SAS. OK, go download SAS, install it on your computer, mess up your, your, your file system. Hopefully something works. Oh, it didn't work. Afternoon is gone. You're not going to try SAS. I just go to JSBin, say pre-compile pre, pre a SAS, type in some SAS. Oh, cool. This is what SAS is. Most of what we do nowadays does not work offline anymore. You need to run a local server anyways. So why are our development environment not also on the web? And there are many out there that are there. And I see incredibly creative people like Anna Tudor and people like that that only work in those. They don't have anything installed on their computer because they just go online and start typing and do cool stuff. Because all editors that we have nowadays that are not these C++ installable things anymore. Most of them are actually uh, electron engines or JavaScript systems that run inside the browser. So all of them work online and can be edited by us. I loved when HomeSite came out in 1997, 1998, because it was written in JScript, you know, Microsoft's red-headed stepchild of JavaScript back then. And nowadays, all these are hackable. Atom was the first one to be hackable. VS Code is written in TypeScript. You can actually change that editor to your needs. 
We have the browser, developer tools in the browser, also written in TypeScript. And they're actually remote editable. So you can just run them in the background. You can have a browser, a headless browser, as just an instance running from your code. You don't have to go to the browser anymore. You can have just the results from the browser. And the documentation that we have, like the MDN and can I use of this world, all have APIs. So this is super powerful and flexible because we can mix and match those things to make environments where people learn while they're developing. For example, you can't know everything. As I said, there's lots of stuff, accessibility, performance, and so on. So how about we have in-context documentation and linting while we are coding? This is in Visual Studio Code. You see there's these, probably on that screen, I don't know, yeah. There's little red squiggly lines under that. That's like when you type something wrong in Word. This is annoying. You know something is wrong there. So you hover over that, and then you realize, for example, this button element is a button element. It is a button labeled by its content. But as browsers are sometimes terrible, you also have to give a button type button, which seems redundant, but it's the only way to make it work across browsers. And that is one of those tests you don't know, but now you know to get that squiggly line away from you. Output is not supported by Internet Explorer. OK, but it's, it's still interesting to know that an output element might not work in this environment where you want to have it. And when you type an image in without an alternative text, it tells you images need alternative text. And we don't do that. We hope that browsers generate something with AI or something. And I love that. I become a better developer since I use that kind of environment because I'm not putting wrong things into the debugging flow. I'm not putting wrong things into production. I just learn things while I'm doing it and I'm not doing them wrong any longer. Context switching that I talked before is, is tiring as well. This is another instance where I can use a browser in the background, run it as a headless browser. So it opens up the browser window, then it goes away. And I get a preview inside my editor itself of that browser that is fully interactive. And I can start now doing my debugging and my CSS tweaking inside my editor. How often have you written some CSS, went to the browser, opened the developer tools, tweaked the numbers around until it looked right, and then went back to the editor just to realize that it was generated CSS that you actually tried to edit? If you set up your project in this way, you can test it in your development environment, and your SAS or LESS or whatever updates automatically from it. Even wilder idea, uh, we said earlier Stack Overflow, we could just go to Stack Overflow and just copy and paste code. Computers can do that better for us. This is another environment that I've been using and I've been working on, where now in this case Python, it actually scrapes from the 3,000 most upvoted uh, uh, projects or most successful projects in GitHub and automatically auto-completes the code from you while you're typing it in there. So it turns Python into a typed language, which is crazy thinking, but at the same time, we do that by hand now. We don't even know what we're putting in there. At least in this case, we could also automatically test if it's secure. So I'm sorry, I have no easy answers. I have nothing to give you to say like, oh, this is the future of it. But I know that in an open mind and with open ears and an open source environment, we can fix this. We can get as excited as I was when I started. Because automation is happening everywhere. People are worried about their jobs, are worried about what we build taking their jobs away. So this is probably a good time to make it easier for people to become a developer by using these systems and not telling them to go and read it up. This is your world to build. The editor, the browser, and the docs that teach people great practices while they're developing, not after they messed it up. Thank you. <laughs>